What I'd like to do today is to give an overview of a forthcoming book, uh, Social Practices as oh, yes, Biological uh, Niche Construction. And that's a bit daunting because there's a lot of pieces to this book. And so I'm going to have to skim over some, some you know, many very, very important details in order to get to the larger structure of the argument. But basically, in the talk, I'm going to do three things, although these are not really a, in, you know, in equal proportion. I'm going to very briefly talk about the, the overall project of the book, which is to develop what I call a nature cultural account of human beings and human ways of life that, is an, that aims to overcome con, um, conceptual bifurcations and duplications between understanding human beings as animals and understanding as sociocultural persons. These are, of course, embedded in much of the structure of our intellectual life and our academic disciplines. And so, and that raises some interesting and complicated problems. But that will be brief. And then in the second part, I'm going to talk about a couple of the elements that I draw on very extensively and also rework. I've just spent with the, uh, with the, um, the reading group uh, talking about the, you know, the use that I make of recent developments in evolutionary biology. I'm going to talk more extensively about what I have to say about uh, the social theory of practices, both drawing on central elements of that and revising some. And then I really want to spend much of my time talking about some of the consequences of this account, because I think the whole point of doing this is to ask, does it help us rethink any other issues that we might not think of in the same way, or that we might have problems thinking about? And so I'm going to talk about mostly about normativity and how I, what it means to think of normativity as a biological phenomenon. I'll be much briefer about language and power, but those are both issues that I think have been problematic in social theory, and which I think, uh, think can we can do better with. And then just a last brief coda about the broader implications of the book for our current situation as human beings. Okay, so the first part, uh, which is really just laying out the aims of the project. Okay, there we, there we go. Uh, okay, so uh, just wanted to point to a number of the obvious elements of the way in which I think we have parallel and duplicated accounts of the human. Human bodies are physical, we understand as physical chemical processes that are functionally organized, evolved, developing, and so forth. We understand human persons as having lives composed of meaningful actions, projects, roles, careers, a life course. We talk about both developing. <laughs> the growth, differentiation, functional organization, and aging bodies, the acculturation, education, and maturation. And so forth of human persons. We recognize human bodies as sexually reproducing organisms with a fairly moderate sexual dimorphism and some intersex ex bodies, aids that don't fit those in, into a dimorphic category. But we understand persons as living their lives with diverse sexualities, kinship relations, genderings, and so forth. And on, you know, ecological environments and social cultural environments. And of course, at the same time, we also recognize that in some sense, people are their bodies, <laughs> right? Uh, and, and part of the reason why I think we need an, a more integrated account is that I think so many of the ways in which we uh, talk about bodies biologically and persons socially and culturally and so forth tend to undercut and make less intelligible the, the, the crucial relations among them. So that's really a, the aim of the project. And it's important to note that since integrating the social and biological is not a new project, <laughs> let's just say it's been done. <laughs> and it's been done in ways that are not very promising. <laughs> okay, so I at, at the outset, this was one of the first questions I got earlier this afternoon. And it's a question that is at the outset of the project. Uh, we have a very familiar strategy of trying to reduce the social and cultural world to earlier evolutionary adaptations and in, in, you know, social biology, human behavioral ecology, uh, a evolutionary psychology, and a longer history universe, right? 
There's, and I adamantly oppose those I mean, I, I, those kind of projects. That's not what I'm trying to accomplish here. There, there's, a, there's another strategy, which also has a long history. It goes at least back to some of the architects of, the, of modern synthesis, but it's been renewed to, to understand culture as a distinct mode of biological evolution, talking about cultural evolution. And to my mind, this is, this is simply retaining a dualistic conception of the, of, the, of the biological and social with an anomaly biological unification and talking about, for example, interfaces in, in gene culture evolution. The whole point of doing this from my perspective is, you know, is incompatible with, with those two projects. The point is to act is to engage in a more extensive integration of these domains in ways that actually help us understand aspects of, of how we live in better ways. So that's the aim. We'll see whether or not it does anything like that. Okay, why is it not wanting to switch? Okay, we'll switch. There we go. Okay. No, I, I went backwards. That's not good. <laughs> Okay, why? You want to use the, the arrows, the arrows there the we keyboard. go okay let's see i'll use the arrows okay so so now i'm going to actually turn to both the resources i draw on and some of the things i do with them this is i'm going to do less detail on this part than really i need but that's because i i want to emphasize the uh, is what it can accomplish in ways that would, uh, uh, you know, and, that, and that's going to be the, the final parts of the talk. So I'm going to be fairly, uh, no, no. there we go. Uh, I'm going to be fairly brief if, about this because I've just been talking about it with, with a number of you already. But I certainly want to emphasize biological systems as processes rather than determinate entities. Is and I want to think of those processes not as self contained in, in an organismic body that's functionally integrated, but as part as really processes that cross, cross and constitute the boundaries between organism and environment at multiple levels. Uh, and in ways that I'll talk about more a little bit further on, I think this does give us an account of. Uh, biological systems as normative phenomena, and that's going to play an important role in the account. Much of what I do draws on the resources of ecological developmental biology, not only integrating development and evolution, but thinking about development and, and as an e always ecologically, environmentally mediated process. As oh, it draws on the notion extensively on the notion of niche construction. Exactly what that amounts to is, of course, contested. <laughs> but the main point I'm drawing from that, from the niche construction literature, is the causal by causally bidirectional role of, of environments acting on and, and affecting organisms and populations and organisms um, causally changing the environment and that in ways that change selection pressures on the organisms. So that's the crucial notion that I think its construction theory has put forward that I want to endorse. Or I you know, do less with microbial symbiosis, but I think it's an important part of how we have to understand human bodies now. And I draw on and I'll say a little bit about further on, uh, and some of the recent work on early hominid evolution, comparative primatology, and especially on the co-evolution of, of humans and languages. I think work on evolution of language in the last few decades has really made some, some important progress, and that's been important to the work that I'm doing. So that's I, I'm very quick about that. Now, there is a long tradition of, in social theory about thinking about practices as the basic makeup of the social world. It goes, it goes back to people like Bourdieu and Gibbon, Gid, Giddens, and a number of people in philosophy as well, people like McIntyre and Brandon and, and so forth. Uh, there are three things that I think have been crucially developed in that tradition, which I draw on, and which, by the way, I, in, in other work, I draw on in thinking about scientific practice. I think one of the reasons for looking at this literature as philosophers of science 
is that scientific practices aren't things that happen in isolation. But first of all, so practice theory emphasizes uh, as a conception of what they take as the social world, in which I'm trying to expand into the human world, uh, as that rejects both individualist conceptions and seeing the social world as simply made up of individual actions. And this is, of course, classically the, the view of, of neoclassical economic theory, many much work in uh, an earlier evolutionary account of the social world, they have an individualist. And they also reject social holism. That is, you know, cultures, traditions, institutions as autonomous entities. Practice theories take the, take the notion that, that, that the actions of individuals are only intelligible against the background of both synchronic and diachronic relations to other actions. And that you can't you, that you need to look at those interactive performances, both looking you know, what they're drawing on and what they're pointing towards as the basic structure of social life. I think that's right. Uh, it also gives us a, di a, a different take on a whole range of issues about normativity. This is where practice theory draws extensively on the work of Wittgenstein and, and different traditions on Heidegger emphasizing that normativity is not, can't be concluded in norms or rules, but has to be embedded in practices in, in which the articulation of norms is an expression of the normative authority that involved in the practice, but not determinative of it. Again, I think that basic idea is right. And finally, practice theories also uh, uh, form themselves as an alternative both to behaviorism and cognitivism about uh, uh, meaning and the ways in which, uh, which people act, act, act meaningfully and intelligently. In particular, their you know, meaning is, uh, you know, they're rejecting the behaviorist notion that action can be understood in, in very thin, descriptive, non normative terms. They're also rejecting the cognitivist approach which has been dominant over the past 50 years or so, or more, or which also takes the public interaction as not yet meaningful and therefore has having to be informed by cognitive representations. And, and instead, it looks at the ways in which situations and interactions are themselves meaningful in, in publicly intelligible ways. And including, of course, work on language as the public or the or part of the public space of meaningful interaction. That is language, not as a cognitive capacity, which we each have and then communicate with, but language as a shared environmental resource, part of our developmental environments on my sort of view. Okay, even although I take those three elements as, as practice theories, the practice theory tradition is really central, there are at least four major conceptual problems that have bedeviled uh, the, uh, the social theory of practices. And that starts with the very idea of a practice. <laughs> what is it? That's a critical issue because if you think that uh, action, you know, what, what people do is only intelligible by being situated within a larger pattern of practice, then you better have, it better not be an arbitrary conception of what a practice is. Right, uh, you have to be, understand practices in ways that make sense of how they both enable and condition the performances of a practice. And the, the most common and traditional ways of doing that, I argue, fail. Yeah, you know, practices have been understood in terms of performative regularities, they've been understood in terms of shared norms that govern and determine the practice, they've been talked about in terms of shared presuppositions. I won't make this the argument here, but I think none of those have worked. And I think by and large, contemporary practice theorists recognize that. And the most common in ways of approaching it, now in my view, simply punt. <laughs> that is, they take the notion of a practice as something that they can be begin with pre-theoretically and do empirical research on without asking the question of what it, what it is that makes that a practice and how being united in that way contributes to a broader social ontology that is practices in the sense in which they talk about 
are the makeup of social life. Uh, so, and I think that's been a central problem. A second, which is mostly being overcome now, most practice theorists now recognize that if practices are a social domain, they have to include the material circumstances and equipment and infrastructure, and even some of the biological background, while still prior to prioritizing the notion of a practice as a social phenomenon, right? And uh, exactly in what sense that's the case varies with particular uh, accounts. Third sort of problem is more specific, and that comes in the ways in which particular social theories of practice have been developed. There's one whole tradition, Bourdieu and Dreyfus and people like this are prominent examples, who, who see practices as constituted by particular bodily skills. It, it's, it's the ways in which uh, bodies uh, interact with, the, with their environment in ways that they often take to be preconceptual, that is really at the foundation of social life. Uh, and you have an alternative tradition, which instead starts with language as the center of, of social practice and the ways in which a social world is constituted. And the interesting thing about these two different strategies is the ways in which they fail to incorporate one another, right? So the, uh, the you know, uh, the, the more somatic practice theories tend to take language as a cognitive phenomenon built on a lower level, a more basic level of bodily skill. And of course, they also don't talk about bodily skills, you know, the social body and the biological body sort of don't quite meet. And the people who, you know, in classic example would be Bob Brandon, who I'll say more about later, or for whom bodily skill, perception, and action are merely causal phenomena that are not yet at the level of the normative phenomena of social practice. And I think you need to actually get those integrated. I won't, uh, and then finally, a, a fourth major issue is that social theory has, had, has been deeply troubled by understanding the notion of power, which is in fact, its various forms are pervasive aspects of human social life, but it has been devilishly, devilishly difficult in, in much of social theory to understand what we're talking about when we talk about power. And this is one of the things I think a nature cultural conception can help us with. So this is very quick outline of where I'm gonna go with this. The claim I'm making is that practices in a sense developed out of the practice theory tradition are the basic structure of human developmental environments. We have evolved a practice differentiated way of life and the people develop in the midst of and, and, you know, uh, and their bodily skills, capacities, biological development take place in the context of practice differentiated environments, right? And that these are, that, and in this sense, of course, this is a notion of practice that certainly includes the material infrastructure and environment that, and, and the ways in which the uh, practices and that, that material setting have been developed together. The, you know, the central notion of this is, is a reconception of what makes for a practice in terms of uh, the kinds of interdependence among performances, right? What makes, for, and here you get, uh, you know, uh, uh, a differentiated notion of and this account actually draws on as background the recent work of people like Kim Sterelny, Michael Tomasello, Derek Bickerton, and, and others on early on hominid evolution as, as involving a, you know, the emergence of a more strongly cooperative and interdependent way of life. And what I'm arguing is that subsequently enabled and evolved into a practice differentiating way of life. That is being able to have people engage in different practices that depend upon others performing other practices in ways that are mutually supportive sufficiently enough to, to sustain each of those practices. Uh, and so what, uh, what holds a practice together are the specific forms of interdependence, the ways in which, you know, giving a knock and a talk, 
depends on people who are going to show up, who have, are, have the right kind of background and talk directed towards, you know, with, of course, also the logistics taken care of. And that's pervasive in all of our, of our practices. And, and the, you know, I talk about this in terms of what I call the horizontal and vertical differentiation. Human ways of life are made up of an extraordinary range of practices now. That's the horizontal differentiation. And people undertake very, very different practices is, uh, that lead them to you know, developing different kinds of lives and capacities. They're also, people's lives are also vertically differentiated. That is, we each find ourselves moving from one practice to another and having to accommodate them together. And of course, they're not the, not the same ones. So we will all, after this talk, go to other places and, 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 you know, and engage in other practices in ways that we have to accommodate with our being here. There. And so there's a long story in the book about how uh, the pra this practice differentiated way of life forms what uh, Simon and Hoagland have called a nearly decomposable system. But, but I, can, I won't go into the details of that. Uh, crucial point is, contrary to the traditional notions of practices as unified by uh, something common, is that people come into the same practice with different roles, different skills, different backgrounds, and often very different conceptions of what the practice is up to. And you know, what's the point of being there and what would count as success? And yet they each depend, in, uh, depend upon one another's uh, performances. Uh, and finally, again, this is another part of the talk that I'm skipping over very quickly, it is emphasizing in the case of humans, and it's us, the ways in which our bodily skills and our environments are, are crucially interactive. If you know, we are grounded in, in, in you know, chairs, floors, in these cases, nicely constructed to fit, uh, to fit our bodies. Uh, we also are directed towards aspects of the environment uh, and the way and those capacities and arrangements uh, are tailored together over long periods of, de of development and, uh, and, and historical, both in, in lives and historically. Uh, and uh, what else I can say there? there. There, no, I'll skip it. And that includes the like, oh, oh, I, I know what I'm saying. Other people are integral to that, right? Cooperative environments make other persons crucially and saliently part of the environment to which we are responsive, including, of course, the languages which we speak. We all develop normally and, 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 and only do so normally in verbally articulate environments from early the earliest age. And that is, I think, a crucially niche constructive phenomenon. Okay, there's an enormous, I've summarized an enormous amount of, a, of, a, of an account very, very fast. Uh, but what I, you know, the point of undertaking this account and, and conjoining recent goals in evolutionary biology with social practice theory is that it enables us to rethink some fundamental issues that I think have not been understood well. So this starts with normativity. Now, when I use that word, I'm using it in a very broad sense, right? So I'm, I'm talking about how anything is open to non-arbitrary assessment, as good or bad, as, succeed, as succeeding or failing, as correct or incorrect, meaningful or senseless, right or wrong, appropriate or inappropriate. There's an enormous range of normative registers in terms of which various aspects of the world we inhabit get assessed. Some of them, of course, with no adequate basis. But uh, much of that is done, if not always correctly, at least on, an, on an, a non-arbitrary basis. And of course, Part of what I'm challenging there by emphasizing the biological grounding of this is the notion that, norm that the natural world is anormative, merely a matter of causes or laws, and that normativity arises only with social practices. 
is the following. Now, the, the basic account of biological normativity that I'm starting from is the notion of, of these organism environment processes as non-arbitrarily open to assessment for their success or failure. Organisms only continue by making a living, expanding, taking in resources, supporting waste, they <coughs> much more complicated aspects of that. Uh, and that, and they are goal directed in the sense that those processes are only sustained if they succeed in sustaining both the organism itself <laughs> long enough to reproduce and the lineage uh, of which is uh, of which is the part. And that's not a simple normative assessment because there are a wider range of, of normative criteria: health and illness, flourishing and struggling, uh, in, in adapting or failing to adapt to environmental change and so forth, but they're all broadly within what I call the same dimension. And, and the reason I talk about it as a single dimension is that although organisms develop and lineages, and lineages evolve, the only non-arbitrary norm in play is whether those pra those practices those patterns continue over time. Uh, indeed, organisms that or populations of organisms uh, that persist over time by changing dramatically, and ones that remain stable for millions of years, succeed in exactly the same sense, but obviously in different ways. And it's precisely that limitation of biological normativity, which I think has been uh, responsible for the long-standing and often appropriate skepticism <laughs> that biology can provide a basis for the much richer and more complex normativity of human ways of life. What I'm arguing in the book is that the evolution of a practice-differentiated way of life introduces a whole second dimension of normativity, and that it's it's that still biologically grounded, but now much more diverse set of normative concerns that results in our normative diversity and the contested character of this normative authority, which collectively leave us open to assess non-arbitrary assessment, not only for whether our lineage continues, but what it becomes in all sorts of ways. And of course, most extensively, what practices continue with what sorts of points and aims and aspirations. Because the crucial element here is that practices are themselves also in a similar way goal-directed. That is, practices can also succeed or fail in sustaining themselves. Right? And because they are only part of a larger way of life, they also have a more particular end or point to them that, <laughs> um, that accounts for how and why people participate in them and continue to participate in them. And practices have a point. Although, of course, exactly what the point is, <laughs> is not settled, but is in fact often at issue within the practice. We'll talk more about that. Uh, that, of course, has been precisely the basis on which uh, social practices have, and social and cultural and rational norms have been dis typically distinguished from biological normativity. Uh, but I think that standard construal of the separation between them is wrong in both directions. Social practices is always involve maintaining and securing in the context of practice the various ways of meeting people's biological needs. We have food out, <laughs> we have restrooms, we have you know, temperature and control and control of the noise level and so much, so much else on the one hand. On the other hand, and this is more crucial, well, it's not just that particular practices have an end. There's a, there's a reason why people think it makes sense to gather in a room and have somebody talk and, and, and get these critical responses and so forth, and with every other practice we engage in. But there are also normative concerns that arise about particular patterns of practice. And what that then does, that is the kinds of normative concerns that, that concern not just the particular development of, of one 
or one small set of practices, but a larger set. Concerns about justice, concerns about democracy and participation, concerns about balancing lives among different practices that are a part of them, and a long list of others. There's work in concert with the, the, you know, the concern for the maintenance of the lineage, lineage. And of course, in fact, most of us never really concern ourselves very much with the, <laughs> with the lineage. We concern ourselves with the ways in which whole patterns of practice that we're involved in fit together and are open to assessment. Okay, so now going into a little bit more finer grain. And the normativity of practices has what I call a crucial ambiguity. In order to sustain a practice and in order for it to contribute to and support other practices, is it has to have a, a certain degree of predictable and learnable patterns of performance. People have to be able, new people have to, have to pick up on the practice. People who rely on the practice had better you know, have, need to have some predictable sense of how it will unfold. People who are acting for this end will, norm, will, will do what will normally do what would make sense from that from the point of view of that end. And, and that, you know, that has an indispensable role in practice. It's what I call the predictive sense of normativity, the sense of what is normal. <laughs> Okay, but of course, we all know that that is not an absolute <coughs> basis for understanding the moment of accountability and practice. There's also, and related to that, an authoritative sense, a sense not just of how the practice normally proceeds and normally continues, but how it ought to continue and how its relationship to other practices ought to be involved. Because, of course, we know that past patterns of practice do not determine how to go on. It's part of the legacy of Heidegger and Wittgenstein, and that there is a constitutive ambiguity in turn between mistaken performances of practice, reinterpretations of what the practice is about, and innovations which transform the practice. And exactly what some deviant performance in the predictive sense is, is it a mistake? Is it an innovation? <laughs> is it a reinterpretation? You know, is constitutive of the way practices develop. Uh, moreover, new participants in practices is, oh, you know, in this afternoon we talked about parents and children, <laughs> but it, this is also, you know, teachers and students, right? Uh, it's initially, you know, established participants have a kind of authority in. This is what we do. This is how we do it. This is what matters. This is what you ought to. But these are the things, the differences that matter that you ought to attend to. Right. But of course, there's a countervailing authority that arises from the uptake. Is can they can they pick up on this one? Does this point make sense to them? Would they only participate in the practice if it were done differently? At which point the people who are teaching them have to make a, a choice about whether this. This will now count as part of the new normal, or whether this has to be resisted and so forth. The crucial point is that neither of those two senses is sufficient, right? That normativity in human ways of life is shaped by the tension between the ongoing reproduction of normal patterns and their authoritative assessment and revision. This, among other things, has the consequence that if you go back to the literature, you know, people like Storelli and Tomasella, who emphasized you know, for example, the, the, even in early human ontogen ontogeny, Thomas Ello points out, you have much more, much stronger cooperative dispositions than, let's say, in other primates. But those cooperative dis dispositions are not sufficient to sustain a practice differentiating way of life, because practices that involve that kind of interdependence among performances are always open to the decoupling of them, the ways in which people just don't cooperate. They don't go along with the way you thought they ought to be, right? And, and so we're all familiar with the ways in which our practice differentiated way of life is fraught with error, conflict, misalignments among performances, fail, you know, decoupling of the ways in which we each are depending upon one another, and the need to make adjustments to do so. Uh, and this, I think, displaces some of our standard philosophical 
conceptions of where normative authority comes from. Probably the, the dominant approach in much of philosophy today is what I call internalist conceptions of normative authority. Hume and Kant are the classic figures, right? Normative authority comes from agents, desires, or preferences, or normative authority only comes from the recognition of the legitimacy of the norm such that I then bind myself to it. Those are fairly familiar and standard notions. There are also externalist conceptions. The authority of norms is established and, of course, only contextually. I'm bound by certain norms because I'm a, I'm a living being with certain needs or because I'm in a social position, I'm the speaker, I'm supposed to behave in certain ways and <laughs> that is and that other. If I stopped giving a talk and got up on the table and did jumping jacks, this would not do. <laughs> right? uh, and so, you know, uh, you know, or instituted rules, the goods or virtues, you know, there are lots of different accounts of externalist uh, authority. And, and the approach I'm arguing is for is requires both, right? That is the basic strategy is externalist. We live a way of life in which we are dependent upon one another and in which we can only live the kind of life we live and, and accomplish the kinds of things we care about and strive for by accommodating ourselves to others. But of course, practices are also sustained over time only by recruiting, enabling, and retaining other participants. And that adds an internalist dimension, right? That is that because there are other practices and other opportunities, you all you know that, that authority is only established to the extent that it can retain some participants who are who are willing and able to undertake it in accord with other participants and for the sake of whatever contributions they take it to have. And this results in what I call the anaphoric temporality normativity. Anaphora are just our structures that depend upon prior or subsequent you know, pronouns on the classic case, right? Uh, when I use a pronoun, I'm referring to, to somebody previously identified or sometimes not yet identified. Uh, uh, and I'm arguing that even the one-dimensional normativity of organism environment relations is temporally anaphoric, right? The goals of an organism or way of life are only expressible homologically, not analogically or morphologically or so forth. That is, an organism, an or, organismic lineage succeeds or fails in maintaining that pattern, whatever it, whatever it becomes, right? And it's only specifiable within the pattern, right? Uh, and in the cases of conflicts, there's no predetermined direction of fit. Sometimes an, organ an, uh, an organismic lineage in the face of environmental change has to adapt its behavior to the environment. Other times it has to change the environment. More commonly, it has to do both, right? Uh, but, uh, but that, you know, that's the basic normativity on underlying the much more complicated practices that we undertake. In the two-dimensional extension, all the ways in which our practices encounter difficulties, raise issues right, that have to be confronted. And Sabina was just talking about all the issues raised by the strike for the for the genus, which required different possible ways of responding to the circumstances while also maintaining the practices of the center. Right. And so you have practices that in their internal relations among performances and relations to other practices are constantly confronting various issues about how to proceed in the face of various decouplings of one performance from another, one practice from another. And what's at stake in that is both whether that practice is sustainable and what it becomes. Right. And that, you know, that's in the end a simple expression of the two-dimensionality. So what we share in a practice differentiated life is not norms, but we share situations in which we depend upon one another's performances and the performances of other practices. And in that situation, when we confront issues, things that require some adjustment or change, they're the same issues, even though 
even though we have different conceptions of it. That is, we are responding to the same difficulty but understanding it in different ways. And of course, the only way to specify it is the of horror, right? Uh, so that, you know, practices are always involve different conceptions of what the practice is up to, what's important in it, where it's going, what one's own contribution is, and so forth. And normativity in the sense, and this account, becomes established by the mutual accountability of performances and circumstances to what is at issue and at stake, both in particular practices and in people's lives and in the lives of us together, rather than governance by uh, determinate norms. That doesn't mean there is no place for the discursive articulation of norms. On the contrary, one of the, one of the ways in which we deal with normative conflicts is by trying to say what the issue is and say how it matters, right? This is what we're doing and we can't let that go. <laughs> oh, oh, norms, the goods, virtues, skills, rules, various other kinds of normative statuses that we articulate uh, are expressions of what's going on in the practice. And they are part of the practice and have and play important roles. They help direct, they coordinate, they train and new participants. But of course, it's not just that our performances can be misaligned. The ways we talk and think about those performances can be misaligned with one another or with the performances. The ways in which we say what we're up to and, and ways and, and being in conflict with what we do is a well-known phenomenon, right? And that, that likewise has no predetermined direction to fit. <laughs> Sometimes we adjust what we say and do, what we do to fit the norms that we articulate as what matters and what we're up to. Other times we change the norms we express to accommodate what we actually do. And this ongoing dynamics and the contestation concerning which practices continue, in what ways and in what combinations, and what human ways of life are thereby becoming, is, on my account, the, the temporal structure of normativity, right? Which is grounded in our biology, our biology as organisms, but is transformed by a practice differentiating way of life. Okay, so I've spent a lot of time on the normativity issue because I think that's, so among other things, it's central to everything else in the world. But I'm gonna fairly, I'm gonna spend the last 15 minutes briefly talking about two other problems, which I think we get a better account of if we think about human ways of life, nature, culturally, than if we think about them as the, you know, roughly divided between our natural history as organisms and our social life as persons and the ways in which those occasionally interact. And that is understanding language and understanding power. The discussion of language in the book, I'm gonna to have to be, this is gonna be very brief compared to what it really needs. <laughs> so I'm happy to talk about it. For, but I draw on work by a number of people, Derek Bickerton, Daniel Dorr, A.B. Blanca, Michael Tomasello, Sturell, many others, on the evolution of language which emphasizes language as forms of what I call behavioral niche construction. That is, forms of behavior that uh, at, become part of the developmental environment of subsequent generations and change and produce descendant patterns of behavior in, in, in the next generation, which of course are also you know, inter interactive because of the kinds of countervailing authority that I talked about beforehand. And I won't go into a lot. I think many of you have, are familiar with some of those earlier accounts uh, that emphasize the gradual, more gradual emergence of language through, uh, through phenotypic plasticity, genetic assimilation, the stretching of capacities via uh, you know, genetically assimilated capacities, which can open new plastic possibilities. But the result is that language is co-evolved with, with humans. And languages did not spring full blown, but became what they are. Uh, I'm going to skip over all the details of that account and, account and just point out that the one thing that you don't find really discussed in that literature is how language works in the empathy. 
right? That is, and that is, of course, a cent been a central issue in philosophy. And for reasons I also won't go into, I think that the only really viable tradition uh, for thinking about language and meaning and, and, and reference is the social practice tradition that goes you know, has earlier roots, but Quine, Sellers, Davidson, Brandon et al. are the most prominent figures. And that tradition, I think, has recognized a general, a, a general crisis. I think John McDowell's Mind the World was really the best expression of that. The ways in which none of those, those accounts have adequately understood how the internal relations that they ascribe to radical translation, radical interpretation, the game of giving and asking for reasons, or whatever model you give of the language as a social practice, how that actually answers to our involvement in the world perceptually and practically. Right? I think that those accounts have simply failed. And part of my argument is that a niche constructive account of language as a social, uh, as a nature cultural practice enables us to respond to that. And the basic strategy of the book takes over much of Bob Brandon's very extensive account of language as discursive practices modeled uh, as the game of giving and asking for reasons. But it turns Brandon's practice account entirely inside out. Brandon gives an account of language as a social practice that is entirely interlinguistic and then gets fallen sellers connected to the world through the you know, observation sentences as language entries and actions as language exits. And, and I proceed in the opposite direction. Language emerges as a biological, practical, perceptual capacity in which human bodies evolve in the part as part of their cooperative practices, develop our capacities for articulation and uptake, as well as as, uh, as grammatical combination, uh, and only then see how the conceptual articulation is built on that. Um, I don't really have time to go into how that model works, but the the main the one point I'll say about it is that it it, it sees language and the intelligibility of language as depending on a play among three different contextual involvements. That we always, you know, we don't have to first understand language and connect it to the world. It's already in the world. We inhabit a, a, a discursively articulated environments in which words are familiar, <laughs> integrated aspects of how we deal with things. At the same time, that understanding is accountable to the ways in which Linguistic expressions are part of a larger inferential and in, in, you know, interlinguistic practice and is also connected to the uses of those expressions in other practices. So that tri the interdependence among those tri that tripartite structure is the larger stru and, er, structure of how I think the language problem can be resolved. That's probably way too fast to really be helpful. <laughs> but at least it's giving you a, a picture of how and why I think we need this kind of account and the sort of direction it takes. Now, in the other case, it seems to me, I, I want to argue that the conception of power is a massive problem in contemporary social theory. The problem because, of course, power in its diverse forms are an evident and obvious aspect of everything we do, right? We are, we all are aware of the ways in which uh, what other people do constrains and limits and, some, and, 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 and blocks some of the things we want to do, the ways in which we also have capacities to do things that depend on others There's, and maybe even exploit others. And when people have tried to understand the various forms of this, both domination, oppression, and, and so forth, and also the capacities to achieve various ends, which are internally connected, right? That's the point of domination, is to also be able to achieve some ends, and, and uh, the other way around. Uh, and in fact, the e efforts to understand how power is not the same as force or violence, 
for how to think about capacities, powers to, in relation to powers over, or how power involves both stable causal capacities and a dynamics of power and resistance have not been well theorized. Right? Uh, it has been some very good work and it still has very deep and fundamental problems. And there are still very fundamental disagreements about what we're talking about when we talk about power. Um, you know, the consent kind of consensualist account that goes back to Hobbes and Machiavelli, but it's also in, in, in Arendt and, and John Searle, or the more dominant agential accounts or structural models of power all fail to accommodate one another very well. They also, there's also fundamental disagreement about whether power is simply a constraint on the autonomy of action, right? such as the talos of, 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 exercise, of legitimate exercises of power is to, um, to enable us to be free from domination and power, or whether power is a pervasive phenomenon that shapes all agency, or whether actually power is the condition of agency. Those are all alternative approaches. They have not been well reconciled. And the book argues that we can deal with this much better if we think about power, nature, culturally. Almost inevitably, a practice differentiating way of life is power differentiating. People are situated amidst, amid different practices. They develop different capacities. They're dependent upon others in varying ways. Is, and, and that is both the, you know, an enabling condition of much of what we do and how we live and also a constraint on us. Power relations are based in I mean, bodily vulnerability and neediness. I mean, this was a point made long ago by Hobbes, <laughs> right? And, but it's kept in the background of most social theories of power and not made more integral. Oh, and of course, it also, but the exercise of power also involves the need for cooperative support. And, and, so, and so that combination of dependence and is on others is, and neediness in order to live the kinds of lives that we want to lead or could or, or could uh, live has to be have an integrated account and what that gives us is not power as a stable causal capacity but as a dynamic field of power and resistance which is both infrastructurally embedded and enabled and socially diffuse right and on such an account, you do, in fact, get long-term patterns of domination. The classic examples that we're all too familiar with are, uh, you know, around axes of self, of sex and gender, of race, of access to capital, of a variety of other large structural features. But those are not monolithic continent continuous patterns, but in fact, patterns that need to be constantly reconstituted and redeveloped in the face of various forms of resistance. And so what the, the, the book ends up arguing is that we need to think of power not as a substantive feature of the world, not a, ca a causal capacity that some people have and some don't, not a structure or not a disposition to act or in particular ways, but it's also not simply a causal phenomenon like force coercion or violence. I'm arguing for what I call an expressive conception of power. The language of power enables us, gives us the capacity to talk and reason about how the causal capacities of people's actions and their circumstances situated, you know, and, the, and the circumstances and material infrastructure in which they're situated, it changes the normative character of their situation. What is at issue and what is at stake? Right? Power does not determine what we do. It determines the field of possible consequences of, of what we do and the, and the circumstances as out of which that arose. Uh, and so it, you know, the, the concept has this, ha, has this role of recognizing that our causally interconnected structure or of, of how we relate to one another has this much richer normative significance. In this respect, the, the account is very much like anaphoric conceptions of truth, right? 
truth on an anaphoric conception in which uh, truth is a if the concept has the role of an expressive role of enabling us to take over and respond to other people's claims, right? And to, you know, and it's often talked about as disquotational, but it's much more extensive than that. Uh, has its parallel in the account of power. Truth as a concept is not normative, but at any attribution of it is, right? That is, it involves what would be good reasons for making that claim, right? And likewise, power in this expressive, the articulation of this expressive role for the concept of power is not itself normative, but any actual attribution, any characterization of how people's actions shape, reshape the capacities and situations of others is part of that very ongoing practice and normative will be accountable as part of the practice. Uh, so I mean, that's the basic strategy of how, to, how this account thinks about power. In the last two minutes, I'm going to turn <laughs> to an issue that has been suppressed all the way through the talk and most of the way through the book, right? Uh, I mentioned this in the session earlier this morning, right? In fact, of course, other organisms are absolutely integral to our ways of life. Now, if you are already committed to social theory as relatively autonomous, then the fact that human lives are involved in ways with other organisms and it's not surprising that that's a kind of external impact on the basic structure of human life. So to start with this and to build it in would have been begging the question against social theorists. As, as, um, but once you recognize, you know, so once you recognize that the very categories of social theory are integrally involved with our organismic history and our and capacities, then recognizing the ways in which other organisms are integral to human ways of life becomes straightforward. There, you know, classic example, of course, is we just been, we're still going through with COVID-19. Right? COVID-19 was not simply a sudden microbial imposition on human ways of life. It disrupted the longer-term accommodation between human beings and other microbes, right? Uh, we had managed to be able to hold seminars while exchanging other bacteria and viruses with various consequences. And COVID-19 <laughs> disrupted that nice accommodation. And you know, it, a lovely example is uh, the ways in which you know the paradigm case almost for gene culture coevolution and you know and the evolution of, of, of lactose tolerance in, in dairying populations and da dairying practices. But of course, the much made larger modification was the co-domestication of people and cattle <laughs> to enable herding practices altogether, right? And the lactose intolerance was a relatively small part of that. I even go on to talk about how species you know, that could not accommodate and did not accommodate themselves to our ways of life have also been something closely interdependent with us because of course that changed the situation for everything else. The crucial upshot of that, of course, is to recognize two things. One is that we are not the only agents who are involved in our way of, ways of life and in shaping them, especially as we think about problems like climate change and, and the like. But we are the only ones who, with whom we negotiate exclusively. And how to build a shared way of life uh, that goes beyond our mutual accommodation is, of course, the central problem, I think, or a central aspect of all, all of the problems confronting us. And that's the book, <laughs> or at least a short capsule <laughs> summary of, of what I try to do in this book. Thank you.